Where better than San Francisco to spend an evening exploring Dashiell Hammett? After all, our fair city is a major player in much of his best known work. With his stories and novels ranging from The Maltese Falcon to The Thin Man, Dashiell Hammett virtually invented the hard-boiled detective story and transformed it from pulp fiction into literature. Producer curator Brad Rosenstein is here to show how the city and the writer combine to shape each other's myths and produce some iconic American fiction. Please join me in welcoming Brad Rosenstein to the JCCSF. Good evening. Uh, it's always wonderful to be back here uh, and working with Barbara and the incredible crew here. It's just uh, such a pleasure. We had the, uh, a lot of fun last year about this time exploring uh, Ernest Hemingway in Cuba and now uh, spending an evening exploring one of my other favorite writers, Dashiell Hammett, right in the city uh, that he made famous and vice versa. Uh, so uh, we'll have fun. It's great to have you all here. Um, what exactly did Dashiell Hammett do? Well, in a very circumscribed writing life, he basically created and published virtually everything he was going to create and publish within the space of 12 years. Uh, eight of them spent here in San Francisco, uh, and really the formative years for him as a writer. But he largely uh, created the hard-boiled detective story. There were other people working this vein at the same time, but there were none that really refined it to the degree that he did. And he advanced so quickly from a completely uh, unschooled amateur writer into a master uh, of literature. Um, it's, it's almost breathtaking to think that somebody managed to do this in that space of time and create characters and stories that completely shaped our popular consciousness now. And I think as you look back at what he did, you'll see the reverberations of this all around us in every form of our culture and entertainment. You'll see Hammett's stamp on it. And so much of it comes directly from him and keeps uh, coming. He's the, the gift that keeps on giving uh, as far as these stories go. Um, everything in our police procedurals and our you know, revisited husband and wife sleuth teams, uh, on and on uh, through the history of what he did, is reflected in our popular culture. And he did most of this during his time in San Francisco. But I think there was something about being in this city. I mean, there are certainly writers who have written about and in San Francisco before and since, but I don't think there's anybody who's really defined the territory as their own. In Hammett's work, uh, the city really becomes a character, um, and it, becomes, it shapes who the people are and how they're involved with each other. Because so much of his fiction is detective fiction, it's about people pursuing one another. Uh, quite literally and physically through the city. And because he had started his uh, life as a detective, um, he knew firsthand the topography of this place. He had taken it into his bones. And it's there in his stories, and it's there in his people. Uh, and so that classic image of the detective in the Hamburg and the trench coat and the swirling fog pursuing evil people and j hidden gems and stolen money and counterfeiters that image was part of what he had lived, and then it's part of what he transmuted into fiction. And, and so much of it was about, specifically, his life here in San Francisco. Um, the Maltese Falcon, most people would agree, is a masterpiece uh, of his work. And it really transcended the genre. Um, mysteries got put into a cubbyhole for so many years before that. And he really aspired to make it into literature, full-fledged mainstream literature. And that, with that book, he absolutely accomplished it. Um, and it continues to reverberate today. Part of that image, of course, comes from the famous movie, the John Huston movie with Humphrey Bogart, uh, which finally got it right. It was the third version of that story that Warner Brothers attempted, um, and they finally nailed it the third time. And that's become part of this myth uh, of this story, uh, is uh, contained in that film. Uh, the other great uh, trope that he invented was the husband and wife sleuthing team with the thin man. Um, and of course, started originally with William Powell and Myrna Loy in what became a very long running uh, film series at MGM uh, over the course of 13 years uh, and, se and se six or seven films. I'm, I can't remember which, how many sequels there were uh, after the thin man and song of the thin man. Um, but uh, they became part of the popular culture. And it was really revolutionary for the time, first of all, to see a married couple who really had fun with each other, 
uh, who were very frankly sexual with each other at a time when that was really considered pretty risque and not too common, um, but that also had this, were this crime solving uh, duo and this really hadn't been seen before uh, in popular culture and now it's repeated and repeated everywhere. Uh, this all started with him. Throughout the course of this evening, I have a couple of video uh, segments I want to show you, some referring to some of the famous film versions of uh, Hammett's work that have been created, um, but also talking about the man himself. And I'm very, very fortunate. Um, close to, uh, I think it's a little over 30 years ago now, there was a wonderful documentary that was created right here for KQED called uh, The Case of Dashiell Hammett, and it was written and produced by Stephen Talbot. And I saw this when it was originally uh, aired, when I was a very young Hammett fan, and it stayed with me all this time. And I was so pleased to be able to connect with Stephen, and he made available um, this wonderful film. And so I pulled a number of sequences from it that we'll be seeing tonight, which really beautifully address different aspects of the man uh, and his work. So I want to show you just the, a, a first little clip um, from that documentary, really addressing who was this man, um, because he gets, Hammett gets so identified with the characters that he created and the people he wrote about and, and the reflections of those people over time, the man himself can often get lost. So we'll first be looking at some of the images uh, of where he came from, and then we'll start delving into who was the real person behind it. Lillian Hellman, his lover and companion, knew Hammett over a period of 30 years, yet even Hellman admits. I'm not 100% sure that I understand Hammett to this day. Uh, I'm not willing to take my word for, for, for all that I saw. He was a very complicated man. The enigma of Dashiell Hammett is complicated by the fact that the author has become so inextricably identified with his characters. There's Sam Spade, immortalized by Humphrey Bogart in the 1941 film version of The Maltese Falcon. Come on, this'll put you in solid with your boss. And Nick Charles, the thin man, played by the suave and witty William Powell. Oh, I'm a hero. I was shot twice in the Tribune. Well, I read where you were shot five times in the tabloids. It's not true. He didn't come anywhere near my tabloids. Ah? Uh. Hammett himself has been portrayed in film by Jason Robards and Lillian Hellman's Julia. You wanted to be a serious writer. That's what I like. That's what we work for. I don't know what happened, but you better tear that up. Not that it's bad. It's just not good enough. Not for you. And now there's Hammett as a younger man, the tough, lonely writer-detective in San Francisco in the 1920s, acted by Frederick Forrest in Francis Ford Coppola's production, Hammett. That's great cover, kid, the newspaper. I really like that. I knew a guy once used to disguise himself as a fire hydrant. Of course, he did have a small problem with the dogs. Tell you what, I'm going home now to get some shut-eye. Why don't you skip the shoe shine and take a taxi? There's a swell doorway across from my place, and you can stand there all night long. Bring a good book you with you. Get your picture to creep. Your mama won't know you when I'm finished with you. See you later, kid. By the way, your paper's upside down. These are some of the screen images of Dashiell Hammett, images which have helped to create the Hammett legend. What about the reality? elements of all of those people that we see on the screen, um, including the guy fighting tuberculosis and writing alone at his kitchen table in San Francisco. Uh, all of those people were Hammett. But where did he come from? Uh, well, he was born in uh, St. Mary's County, Maryland in uh, 1894 and uh, born to a, a family that was always struggling. Um, his father was sort of in and out of business, uh, an alcoholic, uh, and who always was failing at whatever the next venture was. 
Uh, and his mother's family, who we always felt much closer to, were actually uh, part of her ancestry was French, and they were the De Shields, and that was actually where his writing name came from. His given name was Samuel De Shield Hammett. In fact, when he pronounced it, he would do, pronounce it with the emphasis on the second syllable. But as Dorothy Parker uh, said, Dashiell Hammett was as American as a sawed-off shotgun. And his name has also become Americanized, and so we now think of him as Dashiell. Uh, but it wasn't quite how he said it. But he had to leave school. He was a very bright student, but he had to leave school when he was 13 um, because uh, his father was e eternally failing at business and he needed to help contribute to the family fortunes. So he had no training. He did a succession of odd jobs, which completely bored him and which he was constantly getting fired from. But finally, when he was on the cusp of his 21st birthday, he read this very enigmatic ad in a newspaper, and he wasn't even sure what the job was, but he went to apply. And what the job was, was working for the Pinkerton National Detective Agency. Uh, and he was just old enough to do it as he reached his 21st birthday. And he absolutely loved it. It finally fed all the things that he had been looking for. It was an adventurous and physical life. It was one that had a very strict code. You had to follow very specific procedures. And he had mentors. He had surrogate fathers uh, who would often play a big role in his life. Uh, his own relationship with his father was so tortured, it's reflected constantly in his fiction. Fathers are very, very difficult characters in Hammett's work, often very malevolent uh, towards their sons. But there are also these father figures that are teachers, and that's really what he found uh, working for uh, the, uh, the Pinkerton Agency. And it was located in this big building in, uh, in Baltimore called the Continental uh, Trust Building, and this would become the name of his initial detective, would work for the Continental Detective Agency in his fiction when he started writing stories. Um, I don't know if you can quite make it out on here, but there are actually... Um, right here are these giant gilded falcons, uh, and this is the entrance that he used to go through every day. And in almost every window of the building were smaller versions of these falcons. People think all of this started to plant little seeds um, in his head even then. He was extraordinarily attentive to detail, and this is what made him a great detective. He was able to filter everything out and zoom in on the specific details that would reveal something, even doing um, very you know, run-of-the-mill surveillance work. Uh, he would notice those things that stood out uh, and make note of them. One of the early jobs that he had, uh, one of the more unsavory sides of the Pinkertons, a lot of what they were doing was surveillance work or counterfeiters because uh, American police forces were in a, still in a lot of disarray in those days. It was not nearly the co more cohesive system uh, that exists now. So there was a real call for private detective agencies. But one of the more unsavory aspects of what they did was strike breaking uh, in those days. And there was a real uh, tussle shaping up between management and labor with the rise of the IWW, the Wobblies, uh, as they were known. And there was an epic uh, strike that was shaping up out in Montana. And so uh, Hammett made his first trip west in 1917 to help settle a strike at the Anaconda Copper Works in Butte, Montana. And it left an absolutely indelible impression on him. He was really struck by the disparity between uh, management and the workers uh, and how they were treated, how, uh, in what kind of co cooperation the police were working with the management. Uh, in very nefarious and sometimes very violent means to break the strike. And in fact, in later years, he told the story, the leader of the uh, labor group uh, during this strike was a man named Frank Little. And uh, Hammett said many years later to Lillian Hellman, he had actually been approached to participate in Little's murder, um, which he declined, but which happened anyway. And Little was hauled out of his hotel room and castrated and hung from a trestle as a warning to the other strikers. And all of this made a huge impression uh, on Hammond, and he carried it through with the rest of his life. Uh, when uh, America got into World War I, he was also deeply patriotic, and he also thought this would be a great adventure. So he signed up immediately. He was still a very young man. He got assigned to the Ambulance Corps, but at the time, he was basically working still in Maryland. He didn't go any farther than about 15 miles from home. Uh, working with the Ambulance Corps. And right uh, within six months of his joining up is when the Spanish influenza uh, epidemic struck. And this was a catastrophic worldwide epidemic that took hundreds and hundreds of thousands of lives. And uh, Hammett was affected by this. And, you know, most people didn't recover uh, or were permanently scarred. And it, Mamet, uh, Hammett was in the latter category. Uh, and he started, he suffered from then on, severe bronchial ailments for the rest of his life. 
and this particular bout of influenza almost immediately transmuted into tuberculosis, uh, which was another scourge of the time about which there was very little that people could do and of which many people were dying of in those days. But he managed to at least get well enough to get a discharge from the army and he went back temporarily to work uh, for Pinkerton and he was assigned to their Seattle office. But almost immediately the TB reasserted itself. He had to go into uh, a hospital uh, that was just being set up then for TB patients, which were becoming more and more common in the wake of the uh, Spanish flu epidemic. And uh, in this uh, Cushman Hospital in Tacoma, he met this beautiful young uh, nurse, Josephine Dolan, who actually had grown up in uh, Montana, not too far from Anaconda Works, uh, ironically enough. Uh, but they fell in love and they started having an affair. She was really drawn to him. He seemed very different from a lot of the other soldiers uh, that were there. And he then got um, transferred. They thought the climate in Southern California would be better, so he got moved down to a hospital in San Diego and heard from uh, Jose, as he called her, or Josie, um, that uh, she was pregnant. And so they decided to meet in San Francisco uh, she had gone to stay with her family in Montana uh, w when she had first discovered this, and then they finally decided to meet in San Francisco and get married. And it was just going to be a temporary arrangement, but they fell in love with the city. They were uh, married in St. Mary's Cathedral on Van Ness um, and decided the original plan had been to go back to move in with Hammett's family in Baltimore. And they decided Baltimore was boring and San Francisco was not boring, and this was the place that they should stay. Uh, what was the city he discovered? It was a wide open town. This was in 1921, so it's also coinciding with the prohibition years. And everything was controlled by the mob uh, in the city. The police and the city officials were just as much on the payroll as everybody else. Prohibition was a huge boon to them uh, and a huge money maker. And the city was wide open. Everything was for sale. Everything was possible. And for Hammett, this was a joy uh, to encounter a place like this. Um, and so, but what's, what was also true of the city at that time was a lot of it was very new. Um, the whole, you know, northeastern quadrant of the city had basically been completely destroyed by the earthquake and fire in 1906. And even though a lot of the city had been rebuilt by the time of the Panama Pacific Exhibition in 1915, a lot of downtown was just, was just being redeveloped just about the time Hammett got here. Uh, and then there was a huge building boom as the stock market started to zoom upward during the 20s. And that's when a lot of the current downtown really got built or rebuilt. Um, so he was, what he was experiencing was a city that was almost entirely new. And it seemed like the city of now and the city of the future uh, that he was a part of. This is uh, Columbus Avenue uh, around the time he got here. Uh, this is Lombard Street, just under construction uh, at that time. The crookedest street in the world that we now know. Um, was just under formation then. You see there weren't even houses along there um, then. So, so much of the city that he was encountering was brand new, and he found that really exciting. They got a tiny little apartment uh, because he only got $6 a day working for Pinkerton. They got a tiny little apartment at uh, 620 Eddy Street, uh, the Crawford Apartments, and it was so small that they wound up spending a lot of their time on the roof, which they could access. And all the family pictures of that time seems to be of them on the roof of this apartment building. Uh, but they had a little girl. Um, Josie had already been uh, six months pregnant by the time they got married, so their child arrived just a few months later, um, their first daughter, Mary. And uh, Hammett was ecstatic. He was uh, very happy to be a dad. He was happy to have a chance to sort of remake a family, the family that he felt like he'd been denied growing up. And he went to work for Pinkerton, which at that time was located in the flood building um, downtown, which is almost unchanged um, to this day. And they were located, their main office was, uh, they even though it was in suite 314 uh, of the flood building, and this was uh, ground zero for what uh, he was working on at the time. And it was a succession of cases. He actually didn't talk very much about the cases that he worked on. And there's a lot of controversy about what happened. Pinkerton claims that all their fire, files from this era were destroyed in a fire, uh, both east and west coast. Somehow that seems a little illogical. Um, but what probably happened was because in the 1930s they were very much under investigation for all the strike breaking they'd done in the teens and 20s and somehow it was more convenient for these files to disappear at that time. But any record of, of Hammett working for Pinkerton does not exist. Uh, and there's even been a lot of speculation and argument among scholars just how true his record was as a detective. But they've since found other people who work with him that corroborated a lot of these stories. Uh, of what he was working on. But he loved to embroider, too. Um, and so you never know how much truth there was in these stories. But he told the story, for instance, of knowing a man who had stolen a Ferris wheel uh, 
um, and he managed to help get it back. Um, but uh, there was also, right at the time he was rejoining Pinkerton here in the latter part of 1921, of course, right under their noses, one of the biggest scandals that had ever occurred uh, happened right here at the St. Francis Hotel. Uh, the film uh, comedian, uh, Fatty Arbuckle, Roscoe Arbuckle, uh, used to come up frequently for parties. He was an absolutely huge star at that time. He was second only to Charlie Chaplin, uh, making millions of dollars a year, a hugely, hugely popular comedian. And all the film people used to often come up to San Francisco on the weekends to party um, because of the, uh, the wide open nature of, of San Francisco. And he took over several rooms at the St. Francis Hotel and threw this enormous party with starlets and God knows what um, going on. And there was a young woman there, a young starlet named Virginia Rapp, um, who was uh, part of this uh, wild party that occurred. And in the course of it, um, they heard screams. And, apparent, and uh, within a few days, she had suffered such severe injuries, she had died. And there was a lot of speculation about what had happened. Um, but the fingers started pointing at, at Arbuckle, who had been in or near the room. Uh, and speculating that he had been involved in her rape and possibly her murder, or at least that in the act of raping her, his enormous weight had crushed her uh, in this. Uh, it turns out this story was a complete fabrication. Um, he was absolutely innocent, but the, the opportunity to skewer Tinseltown was so appealing, both to the San Francisco DA at that time uh, and to the Hearst newspapers, that they absolutely vilified uh, Arbuckle and built up a tremendously um, trumped up case against him. And this became front page news across the country and it was the first major Hollywood scandal. Um, he was actually, he was, uh, all he, though he was tried for, on various charges for rape, for manslaughter, for murder, um, in two of the trials it was hung juries. The third time he was acquitted, but of course by that time his Hollywood career was absolutely destroyed. But Hammett worked for the lawyers, for the defense, um, supporting Arbuckle. And again, he got a very kind of seamy, worm's eye view of what happened within the corridors of power uh, to vilify this completely innocent man. But also the idea of fat villains took a place in his imagination uh, from this. And there are a lot of them uh, in his work. So somehow that must have taken root in his subconscious. The last case he claimed he worked on was a ship called the Sonoma, which had pulled into uh, the ferry building of San Francisco. And among other things, it had been transporting $128,000 in gold coins, a lot of which had been stolen en route. And so the Pinkertons were retained to try and find this money. And a lot of it was found uh, stored in little, uh, like in a fire hose and a ventilator shaft and some floating tanks off the back. They just kept searching the ship and finding more of this gold. But there was still um, several thousand dollars missing. And so Hammett was offered the opportunity to actually go on the ship on its return voyage, which was gonna go to Australia by way of Hawaii. Um, to find this stolen money, and he was elated. He had always wanted to take a trip like this um, and was thrilled about it. But just before the ship pulled out, he did one final inspection and crawled up supposedly onto the smokestack and found the remainder of the money uh, inside. And just as he was calling to his compatriots to alert them to the fact that he found the money, he realized he'd screwed himself out of a trip to Hawaii and Australia and decided that was the end of his detecting career uh, right then. The that was the story he told, and of course, you know, he liked to embroider his life as a detective. What was really happening was that his tuberculosis had never been fully treated and came back with a vengeance, and it was making him almost completely debilitated and unable to continue his duties as a detective. And here he was, a man with a young family, uh, no means of support. He was constantly fighting with the Veterans Administration to try and get different money uh, as a disabled veteran uh, with various degrees of success. But he um, wound up spending a lot of his time at the main library uh, in San Francisco, which is now the Asian Art Museum, uh, which was just a few blocks from his apartment. And he was an absolutely voracious reader. He always had been. And he, so he used this opportunity to start really reading and reading everything, philosophy, science, and especially fiction, um, and really realizing that he might be able to do something uh, as a writer as he was taking all this in. So he was able to get money, he, got, he was able to attend Munson's Business College and started learning how to be a newspaper reporter. And so he thought something in the writing field would be appropriate to him. But the first job he was able to get, uh, which was actually a good one at that time, was working at Samuel's Jewelers, which used to be right next to the flood building on Market Street. Um, and they were in need, this was the heyday of uh, PR and advertising really starting to arrive in a big way. 
uh, in American business. And they were looking for people who could write. Uh, Albert Samuels himself had done a lot of the original writing, but he was looking for somebody to take it on. Uh, a lot of the advertising in, these, in those days were these very chatty, familiar kinds of advertising, a lot of text, the exact opposite of what we would do now. But they needed people to write um, these pieces, and so Hammett started working on these ads, and quite successfully, Samuels was very happy with him. And he became one of these surrogate fathers uh, to Hammett that he needed at that time. Um, and Hammett was thrilled um, because he finally had a job doing something close to what it was he loved, and he was making some fairly good money um, and becoming part of the city. Um, Samuels has disappeared, although they were an institution for many years on Market Street, but the clock right in front of them remains to this day, uh, that clock that you see on Market Street right near the flood building. Um, that used to be a very popular feature of jewelry stores everywhere. It's how you would advertise yourself with a clock on the outside, and that's still there. Um, also, when he was working there, he and his uh, co-workers would go just around the corner, the back side of the building, to John's Grill, which is also very much there. And this is when people, a lot of people say Hammett's really serious drinking started happening in these ap, you know, happy hours after work uh, with his co-workers. But um, he always was very fond of these places that he went into San Francisco. And restaurants, uh, in particular, are always mentioned uh, very uh, pointedly in his stories. Um, during the time he was there, uh, the first cracks in his marriage started to happen. He wound up having an affair with one of his co-workers, um, Peggy O'Toole, uh, at Samuel's. And uh, she fit the mold that he seemed to like in his life. Josie was uh, an auburn hair uh, Irish girl, and this was what he seemed to favor a lot of the time uh, in the women he was really drawn to, and Peggy O'Toole was another in that mode. But he claimed later that she became the uh, model for two of the femme fatales in his work, both Dinah Brand in Red Harvest and particularly Bridget O'Shaughnessy in The Maltese Falcon. But he was discovered one day, he collapsed in the advertising department at Samuels and was found in a pool of his own blood lying on the floor, uh, hemorrhaging from the lungs. And this was kind of the final straw with his TB. He was 100% debilitated. Um, Samuels kept giving him work kind of under the table part-time, but it wasn't enough to sustain his family. And he was becoming, you know, a virtual invalid at age 26, 27. Um, really, just getting up and down the steps of his apartment building was uh, very difficult for him. That scene of Hammett going into the bathroom, coughing his lungs up, he actually had to put a line of chairs across the living room because he was too weak to cross his living room um, in the apartment. So he thought, what can I possibly do? Uh, what can I do to support this family? Uh, I can barely leave this apartment. And finally, all the writing uh, and the reading that he'd been doing started to take shape. Uh, these were his two daughters. He had a second daughter, Josephine, uh, who was also came into the family uh, at about this time. So the pressures were intense. Uh, this was the heyday of pulp magazines starting to emerge. And they were in contrast to what was known as the slicks, the high-priced, uh, high-paying magazines that were produced on glossy paper. Pulp were produced on the cheapest quality paper, uh, but, and often had these very lurid storylines, and they were very cheap. But it was where a lot of crime fiction of the time was starting to emerge, and the leader among these magazines was Black Mask. Um, they didn't like to advertise it very much, but this was actually the other side of the coin for two very illustrious literary gentlemen in New York, H.L. Mencken uh, and George Jean Nathan, who ran a magazine called The Smart Set, um, that was the apex of New York sophistication, basically the precursor to the New Yorker uh, at that time. And that was originally the magazine that Hammond wanted to write for, and that's where he broke into print, um, trying to do these kind of quasi F. Scott Fitzgerald, you know, Robert Benchley-ish uh, kinds of pieces. Uh, Mencken and Nathan really admired his talent, but they were really intrigued by his past as a detective, and they really thought he might bring something special to the pages of Black Mask. So they encouraged him. Uh, to start thinking about that. Black Mask was the black sheep of their publishing family, but it actually produced much more revenue than the smart set did, and they were very dependent on it uh, for making money. But it paid its writers nothing. Most of the people who wrote literally made a penny a word uh, at that time. But it was a way to break into print. Um, and uh, so Mammoth's, Mammoth, Hammett, I'm probably gonna do that three times tonight, uh, saw this as a new opportunity uh, for himself. What was also interesting with Black Mask, um, because there was a very different image of women uh, that was starting to emerge in the 1920s. There, there, women had taken on so much greater roles uh, 
uh, during World War I. And uh, those roles were not gonna change then by the 1920s, and women were really finding a lot more strength and power in the workplace. Uh, Hammond and Josie used to joke about the fact when he was in the army, he was only a private. When she had come in as a nurse, she was actually a second lieutenant, so she outranked him. Uh, and he was very amused by that and by these changing power relationships that were starting to emerge in the 1920s. And particularly in these femme fatale characters in the pages of the pulp magazines, there was a whole new type of woman and a whole new type of relationship between men and women that could get imagined uh, in that world. But Hammett realized that to really succeed at this, he really needed to have a detective. You had to have your guy who was going to be um, the one you follow through these stories and the readers of the magazine, every time they saw a story featuring this character, would come back to. And so he started thinking back to his experience in Baltimore at the Continental Building and started imagining a, a, an operative uh, that would work in, out of San Francisco. And uh, he decided to deal with the Continental Detective Agency. And his uh, detective actually never had a name. He's, every story is told in the first person, but we have no idea what identity he has. He doesn't have an identity other than his job. He is his job. And he is one of the first true hard-boiled detectives, as we've come to know it uh, in fiction, this short, balding, fat uh, operative who nevertheless uh, has enormous courage. Nothing really phases him. Uh, and has a personal code of ethics that no matter how bleak uh, the circumstances become around him, and he's dealing with some very nefarious people on both sides of the law, maintains a certain code of honor and ethics for himself that he never violates, he always stays true to. And one of the influences on Hammett, because he'd been reading absolutely everything um, that he could find in the San Francisco library, um, he was particularly drawn to 13th century Norse sagas um, and this kind of chivalric code they often were very violent and vivid in how they described violence. There was a very kind of no-nonsense attitude in them. And he found the seeds for what would become his style, uh, actually in this most unexpected of, of sources. But he, did, it, he also did pay attention to what had come before. And obviously, you know, if you're writing about detectives in the early 20th century, you're still looking back to famous precursors like Sherlock Holmes. Uh, and even though his detective would be a real detective and not somebody who put together clues over the breakfast table and solved murders, but who was actually out picking up information, tailing people, you know, oh, never quite knowing what the situation was, putting himself in extreme danger, and yet finally putting together the pieces. But one of his little bows to Sherlock Holmes, who always had his pipe of Baker, Baker Street shag to sort his way through a problem, um, the, uh, the op always smokes Fatima cigarettes, which were very popular of cheap Turkish cigarette at the time. And he says, I'm going to fumigate my brain with Fatimas uh, and help figure out what's going on. Little bow to Sherlock Holmes. But it was the city, the, the San Francisco that he puts the op in that Hammett knew firsthand. He had spent so many cold, lonely hours walking these streets, tailing people, shadowing people, hanging out in doorways all night just to see people's comings and goings. Uh, he knew every inch of the pavement. Uh, here, every hill. And so all of this starts showing up in his stories, and it gives it such a realistic backbone and grounding. He knew Chinatown, not just the tourist version uh, that people knew, he knew it inside out um, because he'd seen all the corners of it uh, when he'd been there. Um, he knew downtown and could, you know, stage scenes with enormous accuracy. And even though he doesn't often name a location or an address or a specific building, his descriptions of his characters' movements are so precise that scholars and fans are almost always able to find literally the footsteps of these characters, exactly which building they came out of and which street they went down and which alley it was, because he's so precise in describing the city and how people move in it. Um, but it was still this emerging city um, that was happening. There was still a lot of uh, the basic landscape of the place and the bay and the water around it and the sand dunes that were still there on the west of the city. All of that still exists for him. Of course, in the 1920s, the bridges didn't exist yet. And so, and he often had to tail people outside of the city. And at that point, what you were doing was taking the ferries, usually across to either Oakland or Sausalito. One of my absolute favorite passages, it's too long to read here, but it's, it's something I'd encourage you to look up in one of the great op stories called The Tenth Clue. The op is tailing somebody and, uh, on a ferry from Oakland, and he doesn't realize that the, that the guy has a gun and has spotted him. And he, the guy takes him out on the back deck of a ferry, clubs him, and throws him in the bay. And the op comes to, and he's just on the verge, basically, of drowning. And he's out in the middle of the, the bay, pitch black, 
dense fog, can't even see lights on the shore, and can feel the current pulling him out to the Golden Gate. It's this absolutely incredible passage which he describes, and the only way the op can navigate is the foghorns. He's got a sense of the foghorns, the Alcatraz, and the ships passing, and you know how, where, where things are in relationship to him. Um, and it's this edge of your seat um, passage uh, in this book, but it captures so beautifully what this landscape means, and he takes it into almost a surrealistic uh, area. It's almost like this guy is floating out in some kind of existential void at the same time as he gives you every physical sensation of the hypothermia and the water and the current and his clothes pulling him down. Absolutely amazing performance. So he started getting noticed uh, because he was a real detective. Most of the people who wrote for the Pulps, first of all, were atrocious writers who were basically hacks who were just grinding this stuff out to get their penny a word. But also, almost none of them had any actual detective or law enforcement experience, so they had no idea of the procedures. And most of the, these stories just turned into shoot 'em ups uh, that weren't really about how you actually solve a case. Hammond, of course, knew this from the inside out, and so he brought that procedure in. And to this day, detectives reading his work say this is absolutely how you do it. This is how you tail somebody. This is how you would find a lost person in 1928. These are absolutely the rules that you would follow. So he grounds everything in this reality that he knew, um, and it was absolutely compelling to people. So I want to show you another little video clip now. Uh, this is also from uh, the case of Dashiell Hammett, Stephen Talbot's wonderful film, um, talking a little bit about how unique this figure of the Continental Op was, and uh, also the, um, all the stories that he took them through. And this became the feature of ha Hammett's work in Black Mass throughout the 20s. And any issue on which Hammett's name appeared on the front cover with Black Mask and an op story immediately sold 20% more than anybody else's. So he was really starting to develop a name within that community. But um, he finally started being encouraged to write longer and, if possible, to develop these tales into a book. And he finally did uh, with his first novel, Red Harvest. And there's a little bit uh, about that piece as well, which brings in a lot of his experiences in Montana with the strike breaking. So here we'll take another look at uh, the case of Dashiell Hammett. At the core of Hammett's short stories is a new kind of detective hero, the Continental Op. He's tough and savvy and ironic, but he's not glamorous or handsome. He's overweight and middle-aged, no family, not even a name. Just a professional, totally dedicated to his job. Hammett described his Continental Op this way. I see in him a little man going forth day after day through mud and blood and death and deceit, as callous and brutal and cynical as necessary, towards a dim goal, with nothing to push or pull him towards it except he's been hired to reach it. In a formula Hammett short story, the Continental Op is summoned by his taciturn boss, the old man. We call him Pontius Pilate among ourselves, because he smiled politely when he sent us out to be crucified on suicidal jobs. Everything in these stories moves like an express train. The dialogue is terse, streetwise, the emotions understated, the violence breathtaking, death graphic. At the base of a tree, on her side, her knees drawn up close to her body, a girl was dead. She wasn't nice to see. Birds had been at her. Red Harvest is set in a strange town called Personville, which everyone pronounces Poisonville. A western mining town once gaudy, now just grimy. Hammett's model was Butte, Montana. The city wasn't pretty. The smelters, whose brick stacks stuck up tall against a gloomy mountain to the south, had yellow smoked everything into a uniform dinginess. The result was an ugly city of 40,000 people, set in an ugly notch between two ugly mountains that had been all dirtied up by mining. First policeman I saw needed a shave. Hammett was always fascinated by the relationship between business and crime, between rich, aggressive capitalists and gangsters. In Red Harvest, he imagined a town completely run by criminals, it's a vision of moral decay and frenzied violence from which the Continental Op barely escapes with his sanity in his life. I've arranged a killing or two in my time when they were necessary, but this is the first time I've ever got the fever. 
Play with murder enough and it gets you one of two ways. It makes you sick or you get to like it. So there. So you see this new voice that he has emerging. And what's also coming out of this, you know, a lot of American literature at that time, even into the 1920s, uh, was still very much affected by English mannerism and English literature. Uh, and it became part of the voice uh, of written America at that time. And what Hammett and, to a lesser degree, you know, his other writers in the pulps were doing was really finding a new American language. Uh, in this that was language of the streets that was spoken by the people that they knew and this rich inflected language that was coming out of the immigrant experience that was coming out of people moving and shifting across the continent uh, to find jobs and mixing in new social classes at the time and this is what he's recording uh, and this is the language he's character characterizing and in a way creating uh, in these books and it's part of what's really revolutionary uh, about what's what's coming out of this. He wound up with a great editor uh, at Black Mask, uh, Captain Joseph Shaw, who really saw the potential of what Hammond had been doing. He had actually been gotten totally alienated and had started writing for another magazine. But Shaw lured him back. And one of the ways that he lured him back was really convincing him that what he was doing was first-rate literature. And they should really start thinking about um, books, book-length stories that could uh, be serialized in the magazine and then be published as novels. Um, and they finally felt they found it with this story, which was originally called Poisonville after the mispronunciation of the town's name. And um, Hammett finally started realizing that this was a possibility. And so he started at the top. He went to Alfred A. Knopf, which was the leading uh, literature imprint in New York publishing uh, with this story. And uh, his wife, Blanche Knopf, was also very much involved in editorial decisions. And they read it, and they loved it. And they thought that this was something very different from the mystery writer norm. Uh, and something that they would be happy to publish. Uh, and so his first novel uh, came out in 1929 from a prestige publisher. This was almost unheard of for a mystery writer to accomplish uh, at that time. And it was an instant and huge success, and people started talking about, you know, who is this young former detective writing these amazing stories that are also great literature. Um, and uh, it was a one-two punch because he was producing so feverishly and rapidly um, for the pulps that the, it, within the same year, he was able to publish his second novel, The Dane Curse, um, which uh, was uh, his uh, final novel that used the op uh, as the central character. Um, and the, um, the Dane Curse is actually usually considered one of his lesser novels. It's the only one that didn't get sold to the movies uh, during his lifetime, partly because of its lurid subject matter. It involves, uh, it's set among the San Francisco upper crust and involves uh, orgies and religious cults and uh, fake spiritualists. Um, but it also was a, a kind of a lesser uh, companion to Red Harvest, which people agreed was totally groundbreaking at the time. But he had more up his sleeve. Uh, at this time, and he was really starting to emerge as a very glamorous um, figure at that time. Um, and he had this new story uh, that was in mind. He had uh, been suffering on and off with the recurrent tuberculosis, and finally his doctors had said, because the TV, TB was still active, they thought it was very dangerous for him to be living in a tiny apartment with two young children, and so advocated his actually getting his own apartment and separating from his wife, where a lot of this writing happened as a result of that, but of course the marriage started to crumble. Um, at that same time. And then he moved to 891 Post Street, uh, a building that's still there, and he was in that top corner apartment where the red arrow was, and started with a brand new detective for the first time after the Continental Op named Sam Spade. And remember, um, his own first given name was Samuel uh, Hammett. So he identified very strongly um, with, this, uh, with this Sam Spade character. And um, this apartment is there to this day. Uh, Bill Arney now lives there, and he uh, had, has done enormous research figuring out that this was actually the apartment Hammett lived in. And to the best as he can figure out from the descriptions in the Maltese Falcon, this is also where Sam Spade lives, uh, in the same apartment, which he has now renovated, uh, very much in the style of what it would have been for Hammett and for Spade. Um, for followers of the Maltese Falcon, when uh, Spade uh, takes Bridget into the bathroom to do a strip search for the $1,000 bill that disappears, he sits on the edge of this bathtub uh, that's still there. And the description of the ground plan in the apartment is almost exactly what it is in the novel. Uh, even this old-fashioned elevator um, figures in. And those of you who remember the movie version, remember uh, Bridget O'Shaughnessy takes her final ride down in this very jail cell-like 
um, elevator in the movie. But um, something that really reflected his experience here is the scene um, in the opening uh, pages of the novel, uh, Spade's partner, Miles Archer, is tailing Bridget O'Shaughnessy and a man who she thinks has taken O'Shaughnessy's sister and uh, winds up getting shot that night in a, a, an alley called Burrett Alley, which is very much real uh, in San Francisco. And this is the top of the Stockton Tunnel, Bush and Stockton. Uh, and he creates this topography very exactly. He describes, and almost none of this has changed uh, since that time. He describes Spade coming out and putting his hands on the coping overlooking the tunnel and the cars seeming to shoot out as he looks down uh, among them. This building that's here now uh, was not there in 1928. This was a vacant lot. And this very steep hill that started, this is Burrett Alley uh, along here. This very steep incline started here and reached down to Stockton Street. Um, where in Hammett's day, uh, there was a big billboard uh, that covered it, so you couldn't really see. It was an ideal place to stage a murder uh, and find a body. Um, one of the roughest things that Hammett had endured uh, as a detective, and he saw some pretty rough stuff at different times, but at one point he was tailing one person who actually turned out to be two people, and the second person dropped a brick on his head, gave him a some severe concussion. So at the end of his life, he had an indentation. Uh, on his head that uh, Lillian Hellman and his daughters both remember uh, clearly. And Don Heron, who does the wonderful Dashiell Hammett tour, actually suspects, because this location of Miles Archer's murder is so detailed and iconic, he suspects it might have actually happened right here uh, around the Stockton Tunnel that this uh, brick incident uh, occurred, and he decided to immortalize it uh, in his fiction. Uh, and in the movie, it's created almost exactly as it was in Hammett's day. And incidentally, Bird Alley is almost directly across the street from the apartment he first lived in when he was writing his stories at that time. So he must have known this uh, neighborhood extremely well. Um, this is where My Miles Archer gets it. Um, he starts bringing into this new story all these places he knew. John's Grill uh, takes place. There's a meal that uh, Sam Spade has. And to this day, if you go to John's Grill, you can get the lamb chops, baked potato, and sliced tomatoes, a Sam Spade special. Um, at uh, John's Grill. The Geary Theater uh, emerges. Joel Cairo, one of the villains in the story, goes to see George Arliss performing in The Merchant of Venice at the Geary Theater uh, at that time, which is, of course, still very much here. Uh, and he doesn't actually name where Sam Spade's office is, what building it's in, but pretty much everybody now agrees that it's the Hunter Doolin building downtown on Sutter Street, which is still very much there. Uh, at that time. This building would have been brand new in 1928 and very fashionable. And, you know, the image of Sam Spade has usually been kind of the Raymond Chandler image of the guy working in some, you know, dejected warehouse. Uh, whereas, in fact, the building that Hammett places him in is extremely Tony and upscale, probably for the kind of clientele that Sam wants to attract. Uh, one of the really interesting features of this building, just like those falcons that were on the, the Continental Building, there are a number of bird motifs on the Hunter Doolin, but there's also all these Gothic figures at the time. And of course, you'll remember the whole history of the falcon dates back to uh, the time of Charles the Great and this tribute of a falcon that's being sent to him uh, by the Knights of Jerusalem who have taken over the island of Malta. That's where this jeweled bird apparently began. So, so much of the story of the Maltese Falcon is actually featured on the walls of the Hunter Doolin building. So, yet more possible proof that this is where Sam Spade's office is. You can see this is a very Tony location uh, and uh, reflects the clientele he wants to have. Um, Hammett uh, plays this very interesting trick with restaurant and hotel names. Uh, every restaurant or every hotel that someone has a meal in, in the Maltese Falcon, is given its genuine name, as it would have been at the time. But every hotel that somebody stays in is a made-up name. He was just having fun. But of course, this drives you know, Hammett fans and scholars crazy, because they want to locate precisely each of these uh, places, because he describes them and the areas around them so specifically. Uh, and so, you know, but it, it, he, throw, he does little things to throw people off the track, like the hotel that Bridget and Floyd are first staying in, where Miles Archer goes to start tailing them, is referred to as the St. Mark. Well, you know, of course, that was probably the St. Francis, but also the Mark Hopkins had just opened the year before. So, you know, he was having fun. But given the topography, it was almost definitely the St. Francis. The hotel where Gutman and Wilmer Cook stay in, um, the Alexandria Hotel, is given some very almost contradictory uh, directions about where it's located and what it faces on. But people are pretty sure it's the Sir Francis Drake, which is, uh, this is what that would have looked like 
1928 when the story takes place. But it's incredible the energy that scholars and fans have put into this. And uh, Mike Humbert, who runs the wonderful Dashiell Hammett website, created this map um, of all these locations to the best of people's knowledge. Um, and I, I thank him for being able to include this here. But you'll see how incredibly tight all these locations are located. It's, it's, it's very compact, the world of the Maltese Falcon that takes place. Um, and it's really Hammett, I think, starting to, to apply almost classical technique. There's almost classical unities of time, place, and action. The, the novel takes place over just five days in December of 1928. It's very, very focused. And it almost gives the story this classical structure, almost like a Greek tragedy. Uh, happening. Everything's, everything's limited. He's learning he doesn't have to throw everything uh, on the table. He can tell a much more compelling story with less. And it's a lot of what gives the, the story its power. But the, the locations and the city is brilliantly um, used in this. And this uh, novel first appeared in serialized form in Black Mask uh, and then was on the, uh, and then of course was going to be published by Knopf, which had already been having great success with the first two novels. Uh, and I want to look here at our third uh, clip. Um, and the first one is from the, as I said, the Dane Curse never enjoyed much movie popularity during Hammett's lifetime. It, could, it never sold to the movies. Finally, in 1978, they made a TV version of it uh, with James Coburn, who is about as un-op-like as you could possibly be. Uh, they actually looked like they were trying to make him look like Dashiell Hammett, uh, as you'll see in the film. But it captures nicely the end of the story. Through a lot of it, um, the op has saved a young heiress who's been battling a, a drug addiction. And he takes her through a very harrowing um, recovery period, and she finally is able to kick her dependence. And then at the end of the story, she's returned. You know, it's again that kind of chivalric code. The princess is returned to her castle, and the knight goes back on his quest. So you'll see a little bit of the, that in the, in the scene from the Dane Curse, uh, which is pretty close to what it is in the, in the book. And then the second part is about the Maltese Falcon and uh, the impact it has, which I think we all know. But uh, this will give you a little bit more insight. Or not. Hmm. Well, let me describe the Maltese Falcon to you. Uh, no. A anyway, I'm sorry you can't. I'm, the, the clips aren't showing up, but. Um, the, um, well, this is, the, this is what, what follows it. The, the acclaim that followed the release of the Maltese Falcon, it took um, Hammett into a completely different ball game. And by this point, at the end of 1929, he decided to move to New York um, and be there for the publication of the book. And so he was able to enjoy this tumultuous success and the parties and the celebrity that started following it. And at the time, he was often being compared to Hemingway. And as you'll see, even one of these reviews said he was better than Hemingway. Uh, at the time, because they said Hemingway uses hardness to conceal softness. Uh, Hammett uses hardness to conceal more hardness. Um, and uh, he became, you know, a celebrity. He always had an enormous sense of style. He had a great sense of clothes, even when he was at his poorest. But now he could afford the best. And so he was, would always be appearing in these immaculately tailored suits and was this very dashing figure. He was only 36 at this time, but his hair had already gone prematurely white from all of his health difficulties. But he seemed this very dashing figure of the former detective who became a best-selling novelist uh, at the time and always made very good copy for people and was very elegant, almost like a movie star. So not surprisingly, by the time his fourth novel, The Glass Key, came out, which he considered his best uh, novel, he was a hot property in Hollywood because the talkies were just emerging. He wrote fantastic dialogue. They wanted crime dramas, which uh, were very popular at the time. And so all the studios came courting him and he made his way out to, out to Hollywood. And he managed to write one uh, scenario for a gangster film, uh, City Streets, uh, and uh, started pocketing very, very large fees at this time. And it's ironic because just at this time is when the stock market crashed and America's heading into the Depression. And the 20s, where everyone had been making money, Hammett uh, had been fighting poverty. Uh, throughout all that time and really struggling to support his family. Now, as the Depression hit, when everybody was out of work and had lost money, 
uh, Hammett is suddenly become, get, making $2,000 a week as a screenwriter, uh, which was a year's pay for a working family uh, at that time. And he started living it up uh, and really enjoying life in Hollywood. Um, he started living like a Maharaja in the penthouse of the Beverly Wilshire uh, and enjoying all these things that he'd never had before in his life. And, you know, the film world came courting him uh, and uh, he fell into it. And he was a wild partier. He drank to excess. He dated starlets. He enjoyed this experience to the hilt and did very, very little work uh, at the time, but uh, enjoyed himself tremendously and was kind of kept uh, pinballing between New York and Hollywood. But he finally decided it was time to start writing, and just at this time was when he met Lillian Hellman, who was a young script reader at the time, uh, who really admired him. Uh, she was 24, he was 36. And even though they were both married uh, at the time, began this very tempestuous affair, and she came back with him uh, to New York. And they started really enjoying his uh, being at the center of that New York literary circle. This is when the very first film version of The Maltese Falcon came out uh, from Warner Brothers, and it's terrible. Please don't waste that 90 minutes of your life uh, looking at it. They destroyed everything that was worthwhile about the book, including almost all of its dialogue. Um, and other than the fact that it's pre-code and is able to you know, contain some of the racier aspects of the book, has absolutely nothing uh, to recommend it. Um, and there was a, then another failed version in 1936 called Satan Met a Lady. Uh, and again, about the only distinguishing thing about it is that Betty Davis is in it. She said it was the worst dog she ever made at Warner Brothers uh, at that time, and it's a goofy, crazy film. They even totally get rid of the Falcon. and the, the, uh, the prize that they're seeking is the Horn of Roland, which uh, Warner William is blowing on. Believe me, don't waste your time. But uh, Hammett was able to enjoy, you know, he's making tremendous money in Hollywood. He starts writing some stories for the slicks instead of the pulps and making huge fees. And he realizes it's time to start getting back to work, but he would almost at this point t take on anything. And he, start, he even agreed to write a uh, comic strip uh, for the Hearst newspapers at the time, uh, Secret Agent X-9. And he wrote uh, the stories and the dialogue, and it was drawn by Alex Raymond, who was the creator of Flash Gordon. Uh, at that time. And this was tremendously popular, but people thought it was a little bit beneath somebody of Hammett's stature, who people were comparing to Hemingway, to also be writing a comic strip. But it was very lucrative, and he was never going to say no to money uh, at this point in his life. Um, this was also comically where J. Edgar Hoover starts investigating Hammett, because for some reason he thought there was something about this strip that was funny. He thought it was making fun of federal agents. So there were actually people put on the case to investigate Hammett because of this comic strip and they soberly investigated and soberly reported back that there was absolutely nothing subversive about the comic strip. But that was the beginning of what would become a 300-page FBI file uh, on Hammett. He also started really encouraging Lillian Hellman to write. He had actually been planning to write a play uh, based on a story that he knew about some teachers who had been accused by a student of being lesbians. Uh, and had destroyed them. And uh, he thought this was going to be a subject of his first play. But part of his deep affection for Lillian Hellman was to give her this subject and to encourage her in the writing of it. There's been a lot of speculation about how much of a role he played or even how much he may have written her plays. The evidence of people who have examined the manuscripts is that he did not actually write uh, virtually anything in her plays, but was a very, very hard editor and driver and reader of manuscripts and giver of advice uh, and so on throughout her career. And he really made her into the playwright. And that play became The Children's Hour, which was a huge success on Broadway, and which launched her uh, as one of the great American playwrights, which she continued. And throughout that whole period of her career for the next 30 years, he was really her advisor and editor uh, on many of her plays. Um, their life together was reflected. Hammett finally realized he needed to get back to work uh, writing a novel. And uh, their life together in the kind of mad swirl of New York uh, and Hollywood became reflected in his next book, which is The Thin Man. And uh, by some, it's considered very lightweight stuff for Hammond at that time. But it also is a very accurate reflection of who he was. I mean, in a way, these stories become a kind of veiled autobiography for Hammond. You know, at the time he was writing the op stories, that was reflective of who he was, basically, that hardworking kind of lubby detective. Um, by the time he writes the, the Maltese Falcon, it's, it's transmuted into a kind of fantasy figure. Um, and then by the time he's writing The Thin Man, it's basically reflective of his very cushy circumstances, a guy who's not doing much and making a whole lot of money uh, doing it. 
That's actually Hammett on the cover. He modeled for Nick Charles. And this is part of why the confusion over the title. In the original book, the thin man is actually the murder victim uh, in the story. But first of all, because of this picture on Hammett, a thin man looking very Nick Charles-like, the thin man started to get identified with a detective in the story, which he's not, uh, instead of the victim. And it stuck. And that became the title of all the, uh, the William Powell Myrnaloy films. The thin man became the detective. Um, and not the murder victim, but it's quite the opposite uh, in the original book and story. And you can see uh, within six months, MGM had bought the rights and was making this film which would become this tremendously successful franchise at the time. William Powell almost modeling himself on Dashiell Hammett as art imitates life, imitates art, imitates life. But you can see the earliest uh, Thin Man films were made when the Hollywood Code was still in its infancy and they were able to get away with a whole lot. Uh, this almost looks as uh, the two of them are subduing a victim. It almost looks like a menage a trois in the making. Uh, and that was uh, definitely an image that was courted by the filmmakers of the time. But as the series progressed, it ran until 1947 in the movies. They got more and more domesticated over time. But they never lost this image of a married couple who were having a really good time together. And uh, that was a lot of the charm of the story. But also the figure of the woman was the first time that Hammett had not written a woman who was either a femme fatale or a victim. Uh, you know, she can, Nora can definitely hold her own uh, throughout all of this, and she's fun, she's uh, smart, she's, you know, helping to solve the crimes together with Nick, uh, and it's part of their really, you know, kind of challenging, playful partnership that really makes the book as charming and wonderful as it, as it is, and that informed that whole series. Uh, and you saw that scene where he's shooting the Christmas balls uh, off and says, he never came near my tabloids. That was the kind of raciness that they were able to get away with in 1934. Um, his other books started almost immediately to make, get made into films. There was a first version of The Glass Key uh, with George Raft. Um, and as this money is pouring in, the ironic part is that this is also when Hammett's political consciousness is really growing. Uh, and he started supporting more and more leftist causes, even as he himself is living like a Maharaja in the Beverly Wilshire. He's hosting fundraisers for the Communist Party and the Writers Guild while he's in his silk robes and you know having first class cocktails sent up from room service. He saw no dichotomy in this. He just felt like it was what you had to do. This is part of the consciousness that had started all the way back at that copper strike in Montana in 1917. And he felt like um, it was really, you know, he had no aspirations to overthrow the government. It was really more, much more about fighting fascism, which was very nascent in Europe at that time and was emerging as a real threat uh, at home. It was about supporting labor. Uh, and it was about fighting racism, which he was also very much opposed to. And a lot of the causes that he subscribed to were really about trying to engender uh, much more civil rights uh, uh, in this country. So it was you know, part of that consciousness. Uh, and he saw no dichotomy with the way that he himself lived this life. It, the 1941 film version of The Maltese Falcon, which unfortunately we didn't get to see any of, is, um, uh, you know, is really what transmutes that story. Um, that novel had almost gotten lost in the shuffle with the two lousy film versions in the 30s. But John Huston's film transforms it, and this very unique character starts emerging, not just in literature, but now on screen. Many people still look to this film as one of the earliest film noir examples. Uh, sets, you know, the model of this guy who lives almost completely outside of the law, and yet still has a very rigid code uh, in his life. And Houston was brilliant. He realizes that the dialogue in the book was virtually perfect, and about 95% of the dialogue in the film is taken straight from Hammett um, and the book, with just a little bit of editing and streamlining. And San Francisco, even in the movie version, becomes very palpable, although the only part of real San Francisco you see is in some stock shots at the very start of the film. Um, but Spade himself gets completely identified in the city. From the opening shots of the film, he's always superimposed against this backdrop of what's just outside his office. And he and the city become synonymous with each other. You feel that they have this relationship uh, together with them. Um, and this sense of honor, his tie to his partner, uh, which is there reflected in that shadow on the, on the window and this partner that he's just about to lose his life that night, um, who Spade didn't like. He was having an affair with the partner's wife. Uh, at the same time, and yet, you know, in the end, he'll throw away everything to um, see that justice is done in his partner's murder at the end of the story. Uh, Bush and Stockton is specified as the location, even in the film, uh, uh, right where Burr at Alley happens and where Miles buys it uh, at, uh, at the top of that uh, vacant lot 
Um, and this completely new relationship between a man and a woman on film um, that's uh, intensely sexual, intensely romantic, intensely challenging, filled with falsehood. They're constantly telling stories to each other and then ripping the veil off those stories. Uh, really moving into this incredibly rich, ambiguous moral world. Pitch perfect casting uh, in this film for all these wonderful characters that Hammett created. Peter Lorre is Joel Cairo, uh, you know, the perfect uh, Levantine foil for Sam Spade. When you're slapped, you'll take it and like it. <laughs> Sidney Greenstreet, who had never made a film before The Maltese Falcon, had all, done all his work on stage, but who John Huston realized would be absolutely perfect, and who he photographs perfectly. In fact, um, Houston said, you know, this was his first film as a director, and he finally, he really started to understand how important the cinematographer was, in this case, Arthur, e Arthur Edison on the film. The, he drew every single camera setup and discussed it in detail with the cameraman, because they wanted to parallel exactly Hammett's writing style, that etched, um, fiercely realistic, but also kind of fantastical writing style uh, in the images. Uh, Wilmer Cook, the Gunzel, and this was also a part of the language that um, Hammett used to use. His daughters remember, especially his own speech, was constantly peppered with cowboyisms and Yiddishisms they had picked up in his years as a detective. Um, and uh, he refers to uh, Wilmer Cook as the Gunzel, which he even Hammett argued to his editor was, was supposed to mean gunman, but it actually was Yiddish slang for a homosexual kept man, little goose. Uh, and he slipped that by the censors, and it made it into the film, and has become part of film lore. And I think I'm getting the timing sign uh, at this point. You up for some more? Good, okay. Um, and of course, this figure of the falcon, uh, which is you know, ultimately re revealed to be a hollow, empty fake uh, that they all have been pursuing and killing for and scheming for. Even Sam Spade finds himself caught up in that, in that kind of magic. Uh, and it becomes this, this symbol of human aspiration and all the things that people will do even for something that's revealed to be a fantasy. And this becomes the main uh, theme in almost every John Huston film to follow. Uh, the Treasure of the Sierra Madre, The Man Who Would Be King. Um, people chasing something, and it doesn't really matter what it is. The point is they're chasing something, and it means something to them, even when it's revealed to be fake. Uh, it's the chase that matters. Uh, and of course, Spade's final decision, which comes straight out of the book, to turn over Bridget, who he's been sleeping with and been romancing at the same time as he's realizing that she's been deceiving him, and finally realizes that she's the person who shot his partner, and she's going to pay. Uh, she's going to go over for it. And that image of her going down in the elevator, which is exactly the elevator from Hammett's building uh, that looks like a jail cell already uh, in her part of it. The, uh, one of the few lines that's in the movie that is not from Hammett's book is the famous last line of the film. Uh, Ward Bond picks up the Falcon and says, heavy, what is it? And Sam Spade picks it up and says, the uh, stuff that dreams are made of. And it's a paraphrase, of course, from The Tempest. Um, but John Huston had always gotten the credit for writing that line. And shortly before he died, he said, I just want to set something straight. He said, I always get the credit for that line. He said, you know who suggested that? Humphrey Bogart on the set. It was his idea, and they said, perfect. That was it, and it was the perfect line to end the film. And it made Bogey a star. He had been, throughout the 30s, he had struggled and usually got cast in gangster roles and had never really caught on too much with the public and had never found the right character. But with Spade, he found it perfectly, this guy who's on the right side of the law but always out for himself and always out for some higher code. And it really became his persona on screen and off. There was a much better film version of The Glass Key that was made in the early 1940s with Alan Ladd and uh, introducing Veronica Lake with her peekaboo hairstyle uh, that became part of that you know, icon of the, of the noir detective. Uh, and it's a, very, it's a very tough, uncompromising film for 1942. But of course, at this time, by the time this is released, America's at war again. And despite the fact that he was 49 years old and in terrible health, Hammett decided to go back in the army. Uh, and enlisted as a private and just wanted to do whatever he could. And uh, finally, he was upgraded to corporal, and he was it was decided they would send him to the Aleutians in uh, the Alaskan chain, uh, to the island of Adak. There had been very intense fighting there in the early days of the war with the Japanese. It was now in American hands, but the, uh, the soldiers had to stay there to hold the position, but they were, you know, was, they felt terrible morale because these guys wanted to be in the fighting, and they were, you know, thousands of miles away from where anything was happening. 
So they started a, a newspaper uh, that became very popular, and, and Hammett was the editor, and uh, really did wonders for improving the morale of these guys stuck out on this uh, Aleutian Island. Hammett himself loved it. He loved islands, he loved that kind of isolation, he loved the discipline and order of the army, which he'd always been lacking uh, in his own life, and he really thrived during the war years. Um, and also, you know, maintained his, uh, all the liberal causes that he'd been involved with. The one celebrity he was really impressed on meeting was the heavyweight fighter Joe Lewis. Uh, when he came through. But after the war, he really lost his way. He went back to New York, and he had money rolling in from every side. There were now radio versions of The Thin Man and uh, Sam Spade, and he even invented, <laughs> invented, his whole concept was writing the words, The Fat Man, on a piece of paper, which got him thousands and thousands of dollars from a new radio series uh, that was running. So he basically had to do nothing uh, to be making lots of money at this time. Um, and so, unfortunately, he spent a lot of the time drinking. Uh, he was always attempting to write something, but he wanted to write something that was outside of detective thriller genre and was constantly finding himself blocked. Uh, he had written nothing since The Thin Man, really. And uh, for years and years, it just became worse and worse and harder and harder for him to bear, but he couldn't find his way into what he really wanted to accomplish, which is what he thought was serious literature. Um, he, this is also when pocket books start really emerging, cheaper paperbacks uh, during the 1940s, so his work becomes even more popular and easier for people to get um, at that time. Secret Agent X9, his old comic strip, got made into a movie serial starring a very young Lloyd Bridges uh, at that time. So yet another revenue stream for this man. He had to do nothing, basically, to uh, you know, have his work make lots of money. So he's, you know, ping-ponging again, back and forth from Beverly Hills to New York, um, but not accomplishing very much. His family had moved, uh, his wife and two children had moved to Los Angeles and it became kind of his second stop when he was in Los Angeles. But he maintained a very separate life from them, uh, this life that he lived with L Lillian Hellman and the movie people and the New York sophisticates and the life that he lived with his family uh, in Los Angeles. They bought, uh, he and Hellman bought a farm uh, together that he took a lot of pride in, but it also just became some other way for him to expend energies without doing the creative work that he felt he should be doing. And all during this time, Hellman stars rising tremendously as a playwright at that time, thanks to his uh, tutelage and uh, editorship and really holding her nose to the grindstone and insisting she do the best work she could do. Um, but right at this time is when HUAC uh, is starting to happen. The House and American Activities Committee starts hunting communists in the film industry, and uh, Hammett had been openly that. There's a lot of controversy whether he was actually a member of the party or not, but there seems to be agreement that he was. But he, he felt there was nothing to hide, and he was doing nothing illegal. He was doing what he, was his right to do as an American, just because the causes were unpopular. But J. Edgar Hoover had been on his tail for a while, going all the way back to the X-9 comic strip incident. And this just gave him license to really go after Hammett. And uh, what finally got him was he had been the honorary chairman of something called the Civil Rights Congress, which had provided bail to some of the leaders of the Communist Party in America, and they had jumped bail. And these guys were responsible, uh, Hammett and his other leaders uh, in the Congress, and they were called up before a federal district court in New York. And he refused to say who had contributed to the fund. He wouldn't name the names. And in fact, in retrospect, most people say he probably didn't even know the names, but he thought it was wrong to you know, be tarring people with that brush. And so he refused to speak, was held in contempt, as many of the, uh, many of the HUAC uh, uh, witnesses were, and spent six months in jail in a federal correctional facility in Kentucky. And by the time he came out, his health was really never the same. Uh, from that point, it was really destroyed. Everybody said he was just not the same guy um, after the prison sentence. He'd held up well during the time in prison, but afterwards he was really broken. And he became really a, a recluse. Uh, but all that money had, that had been pouring in got cut off uh, immediately at this time because uh, they started attacking him for back taxes that had been unpaid. They started attaching his royalties. He, be, he went from earning $100,000 a year to being virtually penniless and was being supported by Hellman and a bunch of his friends at that time. And uh, because they thought his books were subversive, they removed them from shelves, they wouldn't be published, his radio series went off the air. Um, he basically became a non-person um, and was really removed from public life. And his health was such that he really couldn't do much anyway. And so he really became reclusive these final years. He kept trying and trying to write something new, but, uh, but couldn't. And um, finally wound up uh, 
dying in the early part of 1961 of, again, the complications from all those years of the lung incidents and the TB and the Spanish flu and, of course, years of smoking uh, on top of all of that. Um, but what he accomplished in his life, even though he wrote virtually nothing in those last 30 years, although he was constantly trying, was a really reinvention of, of popular culture. Uh, at the time, and so much of that had to do with those very formative years here in San Francisco. And I think part of why he stopped writing was he got removed from the city. I think the city was really a touchstone for him um, as, where t as a landscape that he knew and a place to really put his characters. And when he lost touch with that, he lost touch with a lot. I think he also um, really lost touch with the, the detective thriller genre, which I think was perfect for him to keep expressing what he wanted to express. He could have pulled it and tugged it in any direction he wanted. Um, even in a Joycean or surrealistic direction, but um, it was really the, the place that gave him a foundation and a form for everything he wanted to say, and unfortunately, um, without that, he started getting lost. Anyway, thank you so much for listening. So we, we do have time. We do have time for a couple of questions, but I just want to say this is the second evening Brad has done for us. And what a pleasure. The way he brings history alive, um, the way he um, brings us something that's unique that nobody else has and creates an environment and, and a desire to know more and go back and read those books. And um, I'm just so um, happy to have you here, Brad. Thank you. So thank, thank you very you, much. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. Thanks. <laughs> and uh, I see a question right there. Just put your hand up if you, if you want to come on out here so it be easier. And everybody else, Siri has a microphone on the other side. If you have a question for Brad, please <coughs> just get your hand up. First of all, I want to say thank you for one of the most delightful and informative evenings I've spent. Thank you. I mean, I, I, thank you very much. I can't begin to tell you how, how really, I, before I forget, though, where was he buried? In Arlington, and that was his wish. He was a veteran of the Army in two wars. Okay. Um, J. Edgar Hoover tried to prevent it from happening. Uh, he said he would be a disservice to all those other soldiers in the cemetery. But, but there was no arguing with the fact he was a veteran of two wars and had every right to be there, and he won. He got his, his burial there. The, it's the, the, the real question, though, I wanted to ask you is, at the very beginning of your talk, you mentioned, um, was it the marriage on, uh, at St. Mary's Cathedral? You, I think you said on... Uh, on Van Ness. It's not there anymore. Yeah. That's yeah. what I wanted, because mm -hmm. I happen to live on Venice, and I look at St. Mary's Cathedral, which is on Geary, right. and that's the only thing you said that I a just different, had a, a different St. Mary's. A, a different St. Mary's. Now I feel yes. better. That cathedral Thank was raised. Again. Yeah. I love that we're having a discussion about cathedrals at the JCC. I just, <laughs> I, I love that. Next one is right down here in front. Uh, shadows seem to be so important in this genre. So when you had this slide of the detective agency and the shadow behind the window, somebody needs to take a picture of you with that and that shadow over there. <laughs> it is wonderful. We got our own noir going. Yeah, exactly. But it was also, you know, shadowing was a very important motif in, in Hammett's work. That was the work he basically did as a detective. The trailing was called shadowing, and one of the best biographies out about him is called Shadow Man. Um, because it was so much a part of who he was, that kind of subverting his own identity and yet asserting it at the same time was very much a dichotomy he lived with. Next question is up here, Brad, in the middle. Uh-huh. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah, great talk. Um, uh, it strikes me uh, all through this that, you know, he, he's such a, a realistic writer and he's actually, like, reproducing all of the places and the experiences that he's had in his life, and, mm -hmm. we're, and we're fascinated to learn... Uh, the correspondences, but like you go 50 years back and people would be more interested in a story about a trip to the moon or, or going around the world in a balloon or something like that. And if somebody came and said, I've got this city job where I'm in peril and, and it's very exciting and I'm going to write about that, people would be like, nah, do, the, do the rocket ship story or something. So what, what does that suggest about the shift in, in the culture that we're so fascinated with? Like, you know, even caring where Baker Street is now, or, or you know things like that. Like we, we really care about 
the the reality of the thing, the the authenticity of the thing. Well, I mean, I think I think everything goes in cycles, and I, I think the reality that he was dealing with back when he was writing these stories in the in the twenties was also very much a part of what people wanted to experience. As I said, the physical city of San Francisco that he was living in was very new. Almost all this stuff had been rebuilt in the years just before he got here, or was even being constructed then. And so the fascination of life in a city was still a big deal for a lot of America. A lot of America was not living in a big city with this kind of activity going on. That's what excited Hammett when he got here. This was not Baltimore, um, you know, and he had already come from what would be considered a pretty big town. So what he was writing about was actually the apex of Exotica, you know, uh, and he also had the romance of Chinatown that you know, hardly any place else in the world, in, in the United States at that time had. So for people at that time, this was the fantasy, you know, and the way he couched it in this swirling fog and these mean streets and these up and down hills that suggested so many sinister shadows lurking was the creation of a kind of fantasy that fed into something people really wanted at that time. All those early sound films that he was involved with were gangster films. It was a huge genre at that time. There was a huge fascination during the Depression because that was the opposite side of the coin. A lot of criminals were heroes at that time. It was this upside down world um, that everyone was experiencing. And that's what Hammett was capturing. And I think to them it seemed as fantastic as it was real. Next question is up here in the back. Uh -huh. Hi, Brett. This is Ninke. Hi. Hi, Ninke. <laughs> this is a great lecture. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, are most of the books based on real detective uh, events in his office? He, oh. he, he, pick, he picked and chose, and it wasn't always even stuff that came from his detective experience. One of the books that he talks about this, when it, when it was reissued uh, a couple of years after its publication, it was The Maltese Falcon. He talked in detail about where a lot of the sources for it had come from. And some of them were very much uh, from his uh, detective days. The Gutman, the fat man, was based on a guy he'd been trailing who was a supposed German spy, who he incidentally said was the most boring man he ever tailed is in his entire life. The uh, uh, Wilmer, the, the gunman, was a uh, fresh-faced uh, counterfeiter who he had encountered here uh, in San Francisco, was based uh, on that person. As I mentioned, one of his co-workers, the woman he had an affair with when he worked at Samuel's, was the partial inspiration for Bridget O'Shaughnessy. And he said the other part of her, the inspiration for her, the liar and, and the, the kind of airiness that Mary Astor gets in her performance, came from a woman who actually came and hired him from Pinkerton's to come fire her housekeeper for him. Um, and uh, he was so amused by this affected, you know, playful woman, she became part of Bridget uh, herself. So he picked and chose, and there, it was sometimes details from his personal life, too. Iva, the wife of Miles Archer, who Spade has an affair with, her name actually came from Hammett's favorite bookseller. So, who knew, you know? But, it, it, you know, everything informed what he did. Everything became grist for the mill, and then his fantasy worked on it. I wish we had been able to see that clip uh, about the Maltese Falcon, because Joe Gores, uh, who was a former detective and novelist and great Hammett scholar, said something really brilliant about Hammett. He said his details, his factual details, are always very solid and precise, but his plotting of the books is wildly romantic. And I think it's that combination of the two, that rootedness and his powers of observation, coupled with this incredible fantasy about finding this jeweled bird that's traveled through the centuries to San Francisco. That's the key, I think, to a lot of Hammett's appeal. Next question's right here. Uh, what insights can you give us about the relationship between Lillian Hellman and Dashiell Hammett? It was certainly not simple. Never simple. And, and as she said at the beginning, you know, she said, I don't think to this day I understand him, his own family members. Uh, and he was very close in his way to his, uh, his daughters, especially his daughter, Jo, uh, who wrote, incidentally, probably one of the best uh, books about him, uh, remembering her father, the most insightful, I think, about him as a person. But he was a man of tremendous contradictions. He was a man who didn't share a lot about his interior life, even with those who were closest to him. And he did things that seemed to be tremendously contradictory, and yet to him made perfect sense, like you know, uh, holding Communist Party fundraisers in his penthouse at the Beverly Wilshire. Um, you know, these things, there was no dichotomy in that uh, for him. And I think 
their relationship, I think, reflected a lot of that. Um, I think there's absolutely no question he was, he was in love with her, and it was the central relationship of his life. And I think the way he was able to show it was the guidance he gave her as a writer. Um, he gave her his idea, her idea for that first play, which he was going to write. That was going to be the next thing, and the next thing never got written for him. He gave that to her, um, and he guided her through every single step of that torturous process. And she said even she, he would say things to her that she couldn't believe he was risking their entire relationship to say about her writing. And yet she said after she calmed down in a day or two, she realized how brave and how loving it had been for him to take that risk. But that's how much he cared about her. But he could only show it through these side paths. And I think that's what was so confusing for the people he was close to. Um, but that's who he was. And you know, they had, you took it or le left it with Hammett. And he was so compelling when he was at his best, you generally took it. Yeah. Next question is over here. Yeah. Yes, regarding the thin man, I wonder if you could shed some light on, on uh, what role Hammett may have played in introducing the dog Aster into the series, <laughs> or did he? He did, and Asta is in the book. And Asta is another inside joke. Um, the, uh, a couple he and Lillian had been very close to in New York and Hollywood was the humorist S.J. Perlman, uh, Sid Perlman, and his wife, uh, Laura, who was a, a New York socialite. And uh, as a joke, their, their humor, and there was a lot of sexual shenanigans going on in this circle at that time. They considered themselves bohemians who were kind of above this. As I say, when they embarked on their affair, both Hellman and Hammett were married, and they did, made no effort to conceal uh, their affair or their relationships with other people. And um, he, Hammett, as a joke during a party one time, arranged for a stripper to be naked up in P Perlman's apartment and sent Perlman up on an errand to encounter this naked woman in his apartment and then brought Laura up, his wife, to catch them uh, together. And Laura was so incensed by this that she wound up having an affair with Hammett uh, in retaliation. Her dog was named Asta, and he commemorated that in the series. And that dog became, you know, part of the central part of that relationship, but he's very much in the book as well. But I think it's a little more a remembrance of Laura than just the dog. Yeah. And we'll take our last question here. Uh, what was his relationship with his, his two daughters, and who got his royalties? Who did he leave them to? His royalties. <sighs> Complicated questions, both of them. Um, his relationship with his daughters was difficult. His daughter, Mary, his eldest daughter, was very much like him. Um, and she, I think because of all the years of feeling distant and neglected, because he would just pop in, play a, you know, bring lots of expensive gifts, you know, spend a wonderful weekend with them being dad, and then disappear for periods of time. He kept them very financially supported, although given his fluctuating fortunes, that could you know, that could change. But basically, he took pretty good care of his wife uh, and his children financially. But he was basically, in many ways, an absentee dad. And this took its toll, particularly on his eldest daughter. And she got uh, involved heavily, first in drinking at a very young age, and then in drug addiction. Um, and there's a s strong discussion. She's a kind of shadowy figure in a lot of these uh, discussions. But uh, there, there seems to have been some really severe mental illness that was underlying all of that, that didn't really get diagnosed because the other problems were kind of covering it. And finally, it became so terrible for uh, Jose and uh, his other daughter, Joe, living with Mary under those conditions that they shipped her off to be with Hammett, uh, who of course was the worst possible role model. And so he took her out drinking. Uh, and uh, they got into all kinds of trouble together. And uh, she wound up having a very, very sad, life that never really resulted in much because she had these multiple layers of problems that had never really been addressed. But he tried in his own weird way uh, to take care of her. Uh, but they really, they were all dealing with a problem with her that they, was much more than they could understand. His daughter Jo was much more balanced. She got married at a very young age to escape all this craziness uh, in her life and wound up having a very solid relationship with her husband and grandchildren who uh, Hammett absolutely doted on was uh, by that time he'd stopped drinking and became a really wonderful grandfather uh, the, in many ways the father he hadn't been at least for those final years of his life 
the, uh, the royalties question gets very tangled. Um, his royalties had gotten attached because of the uh, non-payment of back taxes, a situation that had not been resolved by the time he died. But because the government had so completely destroyed his reputation and his ability to have access to public publishers and so on, his estate was valued as something virtually worthless by the time he died. And Lillian Hellman wanted to you know, gain control of these uh, and hopefully help resurrect his reputation and manage to get them back. The, the rights to his works were finally auctioned off uh, and she bought them back uh, and acquired them. And she really was responsible for a lot of the resurgence of Hammett. He had really become a non-person. His books were unavailable. People didn't really know who he was aside from the movie of the Maltese Falcon. She got his books back into print. Um, she got his reputation resuscitated in her various autobiographies, which play fast and loose with the truth, but you know, generally you know, accord him a great place. And then she set up a trust toward the end of her life that was to be administered. None of the, none of the trustees were members of the family. And there is, by all reports, a lot of mismanagement, very little of the money which was supposed to be going to the daughters. There was a substantial portion of the estate that was supposed to be going to the daughters during that time was completely absorbed by the uh, trustees that Hellman had appointed after her death. And uh, was 10 years in the resolution, and finally they managed to get restitution and the, uh, the royalties finally started coming to the daughters. And uh, it's now largely administered by Hammett's granddaughter, um, who, Joe's daughter, who's still very much alive and is a Hammett scholar. Um, so it's finally back in some pretty, pretty strong and caring hands. Well, Brad and I are cooking up a, another one, so stay tuned and watch for his name, Brad Rosenstein, in your material. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming. Most of all, thanks to you, Brad, for a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank Have you. a good evening. Thank you.